Okay guys, welcome back. It's time for another lesson. This time it's called Current and Conductors. Let's go ahead and get started. I want to first show you a little demo to give you an idea of what we're trying to figure out here. So here's a picture of a bunch of charge carriers moving around. Let's turn on the time. And in a situation with, in which there's no electric field in the bulk. And what we have here is a distribution of x component of momentum. So that's the component of the momentum vectors pointing left and right here. Uh, right pointing momenta are positive and left pointing momenta are negative. And this is the average. Uh, the blue, the aqua line is the, a, is the uh, average momentum of all the particles at any moment, and the purple line is the time average of the momentum over a long period of time. And notice that the time average is tending towards zero. So this is what it looks like when you have no field and the particle is just bouncing around. You'll also notice there's a particle labeled red, or made red here to ca catch your attention. And you'll notice that it's going left and it's going right, but it doesn't end up going anywhere. It just it goes left sometimes. And notice when it hits the wall on the left, it reappears on the right. When it goes through the wall on the right, it reappears on the left. So I'm implementing a kind of a crazy universe in which when particles pierce the wall on the right, they appear on the left. Um, but it gives us a way of sort of keeping track of what the thing is doing. If it hits the wall on the right and it appears on the left, that means it's gone through you can imagine that there's a cell next door that it's gone into and we're watching that cell kind of idea. But uh, you'll notice it, it goes from right to left and then it comes back from left to right. It doesn't really end up going anywhere in the long run. Now, after we got the demo, let's, uh, let's look at the, our model of a metal. First of all, it's called the Drude model. It's a semi-classical model, which means that it takes into account some quantum mechanical effects but that it also uses classical language to describe what's going on. Things like electron trajectories, forces, and uh, the momentum principle. When we do a quantum mechanical version of this, we have to change our language and use the language of quantum mechanics, which is a little different. But I don't want to have to start a course in quantum mechanics in order to talk about this. So we're going to use this sort of semi-classical model. And the idea is we have these particles that are bouncing around all wiggly-piggly inside the material going every which way. In the absence of a field, there's just these guys are just as likely to move to the left as they are to move to the right. And so on the average, with no net field, with no average field inside the body of the conductor, there's no current. All we have is a distribution of momentum going in different directions. But uh, it is true that in the semi-classical picture, the collisions take place between the charge carriers and the lattice. So the lattice is sort of the atoms and stuff that make up the material. Charge carriers go along and every now and then they interact with atoms in the lattice and they bounce. They bounce off. They scatter. Uh, they're just as likely to scatter one direction as another because everything's kind of random. And so what we say is that the average momentum of the carriers after a collision is basically zero. Um, the time between collisions, we're going to call that the mean free time, delta t. And in equilibrium, where there's no current, the uh, charge carriers are just going to carry on straight line trajectories between collisions. But if we put a field inside the material in some way, if there's a net field, the charge carriers are going to, uh, between collisions, they're going to have parabolic trajectories in which their momentum is not going to be constant. And we're going to work that out in a second, but the idea is that if you add the intercollision drift, if you add the intercollision parabolic trajectories that these guys are going to have, then what you end up with is a slight drift velocity on top of the chaotic uh, motion of the charge carriers between collisions. In the steady state, that is, if you wait, if you turn on a field and you sustain it and you wait a while, there will be a steady state average current flowing in the material that will be related to the electric field and due to the fact that the charge carriers are uh, changing their trajectories in between collisions. At least that's the idea. Let's invoke the momentum principle and see how that works out. So the idea is you've got these charge carriers coming along bouncing from here to there and you impose upon that a small field so that, that carriers experience a force. The force causes their trajectories to deviate from straight line trajectories. And so in between collisions, these guys are going to get superimposed on their average velocity of zero. 
they're going to get a slight drift velocity. The change in momentum is the net force times the change in time. That's the momentum principle. Of course, we can put that in terms of the field, since we know these carriers are charge carriers. We know how much charge they have. And then we can work backwards to get the drift velocity. The drift velocity is simply the momentum change divided by the mass. There will be more about that in a moment. Um, but that's the idea. The point is that the drift velocity ends up being proportional to the field. The stuff in parentheses is all intrinsic characteristics of the material, that the mean free time between collisions, the effective mass of the charge carriers, and the amount of charge the charge carriers have. But the point is, the drift velocity is proportional to the field, and the proportionality constant, which again is an intrinsic property of the material, we call the mobility. So the mobility tells us how much, electric, how much drift we get per unit of electric field that we apply. You remember from last time that the electron current, the number of electrons passing a point per unit time, is equal to the cross-sectional area of the conductor times the number of electrons per unit volume, the number of charge carriers per unit volume, I should say, times their average velocity. We now know through the momentum principle that the average velocity is nothing but the drift velocity, and it's proportional to the field. So we can put in that proportionality and get the electron current in terms of the geometry, the cross-section of the uh, conductor, and the electric field strength. Further, we can compute the conventional current by multiplying the electron current by the charge on a single carrier. And if we put all that together, you can see that the conventional current is proportional to the field as well. It's proportional to the cross-sectional area of the conductor, but it's also got intrinsic properties of the metal or the material itself, which is rolled up here into a new constant I call sigma, which is called the conductivity. So the bottom line is the current is the cross-sectional area of the wire times an intrinsic property of the wire called conductivity times the electric field strength. Now the conductivity also depends weakly on things like temperature and um, of course, it depends on all those other things, the effective mass and the time between collisions and the number of carriers per unit volume and, and the mobility and blah, blah, blah. But uh, anyway, the point is uh, the conductivity is a property of the material. The electric field and the area are circumstantial. They're determined by outside influences, like how big did I make the wire and how did I turn up the knob on the power supply. All right. Let's go back now and look at the demo again with some of that language in place. See how it goes. Okay, before we actually go back into the demo, I wanted to show you just a little tiny bit about the code. Um, first of all, the force that's acting on these guys is a vector, and it has an x component of 0.5 in this particular version. It, before, when I ran it, to show you what happens when there's no field, I had set this to zero. And the other thing I wanted to point out is that the theoretical average momentum, let's call it the drift momentum, is the, is the force times the mean free time between collisions. So the mean free time between collisions is sort of the average time. And the way that works out is we're calculating the probability that a collision happens in a time step as the time step size divided by the mean free time between collisions. So that if you go through uh, point, if you, if you went through enough time steps, you would have a probability that would approach one that you'd get uh, you'd get a collision. That's kind of the thinking. But, uh, all right, so let me just point out one last thing. Uh, here's where we update the time. Here's where we update the momentum of all the guys. And here's where we update the position of all the guys. It's the momentum, current momentum, times the time step divided by the mass. That's the uh, basically the velocity times the time step uh, times plus the old position. Anyway, so this is kind of like the codes we wrote in the first semester of Matter and Interactions, but in this case I'm using it to model these uh, charge carriers. So let me go ahead let me go ahead and fire this thing up and we'll take a look at its behavior. So we've got the red dot again, but I want you to notice that this time if you look carefully at the trajectories you can see that they uh, have ever so slightly curvature. Let's see if I can see one here. I don't know it's not very much, it's just a little bit of curvature. And uh, you'll also notice it's more apparent that the momentum is now not symmetric. It used to go from minus one to plus one, 
and, and not any outside of plus one, but now it's got a tail that goes out beyond plus one. The green line here is now the expected average momentum, the drift momentum of all these guys. And you'll notice that the purple average, the magenta, I should say average, is now trending up toward that theoretical average. But the instantaneous average momentum of all these guys, the X, and this is the X component of momentum, um, is uh, jumping all over the place, sometimes above and sometimes below. But the long-term average, the long-time average, is uh, settling down pretty nicely to the uh, force, times the mean time between collisions. Now some of my students argued that uh, it should be half of the force times the mean time between collisions because they said if the average momentum at the beginning was zero and the average momentum at the end was uh, f times delta t that the average over the whole time interval should be half of f times delta t. But the trouble with that is I think that uh, you can't just pick a time of a collision like that. You've got to pick a time and say, well, the average time between that time and the next collision is the mean time between collisions. But the average time since the last collision is also the mean time between collisions. And so your momentum uh, is still going to be on the average, the force times the change in time since the last collision. Since the, 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 it's the force times the mean time between collisions. Let's put it that way. All right, I hope that's clear. Anyway, it's fun. Okay, one other thing I forgot to point out. If you watch the little red ball, you'll notice that it bounces around about 100 million times. No, that's an exaggeration. It bounces around a lot, and only very rarely does it go from left to right or from right to left. But generally, it's going to move to the right. So there it went from, it went through the right-hand wall and then back through the left-hand wall toward the right. If it were no field, it would tend to go back and forth and back and forth, sometimes to the left, sometimes to the right, but never more any one direction. There it went backwards. It went from the left wall to the right wall. Then it went back from the right wall to the left wall. It's going to make its way through. Eventually, it'll go through the right wall again. And that is an indication that it's slowly drifting to the right. But my point is that it takes a long time, many, many collisions, before the thing. There it went. It went through the wall again. Uh, I hope you get the idea. The point is it takes a lot of collisions before this thing actually makes its way from one side of the block to the other. And occasionally it goes back for a while, but then it turns around and it ultimately winds up going the right way, going in the way the force is pushing it. But it's uh, many, 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 many collision times later. All right, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, I want to do two more quick examples um, before we quit. Okay, I want to uh, do two more quick examples before we quit. I have here a picture of a battery and a, long, and a wire connecting the two ends of the battery, and I wanted to remind you about the uh, bubble diagram that shows the relationship between potential electric field and uh, potential energy. We did this experiment in the lab last, last week, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about how it all fits together. So the point is that if you have a wire of uniform cross-section, and current is flowing through the wire due to uh, an electric field in the bulk of the wire, the electric field along the uniform cross-section, uniform uh, composition wire has got to be constant in magnitude. Now the reasons for that we can talk about. Uh, one of them is that if the field varied along the length, that would mean the current would vary along the length. And if you think about that a little bit, you'll realize that you'll end up building up charge in different places of the wire, and that, that can't happen. If the electric field varied in the uh, transverse direction, if it was larger on one edge of the wire, the left than the right, or uh, whatever, as you're moving down the wire, then that would imply that there was a different change in potential between two points along the length of the wire, but, but that's crazy. It's like going up one side of the mountain and down the other and ended up with a different altitude change. That, that can't happen. So uh, anyway, suffice it to say for the purposes of this uh, example that the electric field along the length of this uniform cross-section, uniform composition wire is constant. Now remember 
that the electric field is the derivative of the potential with respect to distance along the wire. And if the electric field is constant, that means the potential has to vary uniformly along the length of the wire. And uh, that means that the graph, if you were to think of it, the graph of uh, potential versus distance ends up having to be a straight line. And you can see that it's therefore easy to work out the electric field. You can just take the difference in potential between the two ends of the wire divided by the length of the wire and get the electric field. So we're going to do that a lot. If you have a uniform wire of uniform composition and cross-section, you can assume that the potential along that wire varies uh, linearly with distance along the wire and that the derivative, the slope, of that variation is nothing other than the electric field. So in this case you can see it turned out a 1.5 volt battery, a 10 centimeter length of wire, we got 15 volts per meter. Now in the lab we computed a uh, conductivity of 0.91 times 10 to the 6 amps per volt meter for the wire we were using. It was a kind of nichrome. And uh, we also measured the diameter of the wire. It was about a quarter of a millimeter. And if you plug all that in, you can calculate the conventional current. In this case, it turns out to be fairly substantial. It's almost 3 amps. So our wires were actually a little longer than 10 centimeters, so we were uh, under an amp. But uh, just to make the numbers easy, I put in a tenth of a meter, and, uh, and out comes almost 3 amps. So that's a, a simple example of how you can uh, work out this kind of a problem. Uh, the next thing we did, but we haven't done the lab, we'll do that this week, is to have two different cross-sections of wire. We sort of worked out the calculation. There's a thing called the node rule, which is basically just a fancy way of saying that the current into a junction of wires and the current out of a junction of wires has to be the same. In this case, there's two wires, one that's thin and one that's thick, and the node rule simply dictates that the current flowing through the thin wire must be the same as the current flowing through the thick wire. And that's simply because in steady state we can't have charge building up anywhere. So whatever flows in has to flow out. And uh, if you put in the relationship between the uh, electron current and the uh, electric field, you can see that that relates the properties of the wire, like the cross-section and the uh, number density and the mobility and the electric field to the current. Now, the other thing that has to be true is the so-called loop rule, which means that if you march around the loop, the total change in potential energy as you go from one point to the other, that all the changes have to add up to zero. And since the potential energy is the potential times the charge, and the charge is constant, for these, uh, the charge carriers all have the same charge, so that means the change in potential the electric potential has to be the same. If you add up the changes in potential around the circuit, they have to add up to zero. So that means the potential of the battery minus the potential drop in the thick wire minus the potential drop in the thin wire has to be zero. And if you put in what the potential drop is, remember that the uh, electric field is the potential drop divided by the length, so the potential drop has to be the electric field times the length. It's that bottom two bubbles in the bubble diagram then you can see that we now have two equations and two unknowns that we can solve for the electric field in each wire. We could also work out these same equations in terms of the potential. So just replace the electric field everywhere with the potential divided by the length of the wire, and you could work this out in terms of the potential drop across the thin wire and the thick wire. It's really a question of preference. Doesn't really make that much difference one way or the other. Let's do another one real quick, just as an example. And you can see how this goes. This looks a little more complicated, but what I want to point out is that it's really the same idea. It appears that we have five unknown currents and five unknown voltages. But notice that the node rule ensures that the current through AB, the current through BC is the same because these are the branches and connected together. There's no place for the current to go. If it goes through AB, it has to go through BC as well. And so we could just call that the current FABC. And furthermore, the current through CD and the current from D to E has to be the same. And so we could call that current, both of those currents are the same current, we could call that current ICDF. So there's really only uh, two unknown currents.
uh, well, you say, wait a minute, what about the current CF? And we'll see in a moment we can write the node rule down for that one too. Uh, there appear to be five unknown voltages, but what I want to point out is that the current AB is the cross-section AB, the conductivity AB, times the voltage AB divided by the length AB. That's just the current is proportional to the field. And notice that A and sigma and L, if we know all that, then AIB and VAB are just proportional to one another. So we could easily replace one with the other. Anywhere we need VAB, we can put in IAB and so on. I mean, put it in using the substitution. So the idea is we can apply the node rule at C or F. In other words, the current FABC has to equal the current ICF plus the current ICDEF. So ICF is no longer unknown if we know FABC and CDEF. And we can apply the loop rule for the loop rule for loop one that says VAB plus VBC but plus VCF has to be zero. And the loop rule for loop two is uh, VCFC plus VCD plus VDE has to be zero. The point is we can replace the voltages here with currents using the substitution above and we get three equations and three unknown currents. So we can solve the darn thing. That's the strategy. Now, of course, doing it takes practice, but that's the idea. All right, so we'll see you guys in class.